What if Satan decided to teach a Sunday school class and he revealed the alleged real truth about the Bible? That's the narrative device used in a recent documentary that interviews critical Bible scholars like Bart Ehrman and puts skeptical arguments against the Bible in the mouth of an animated devil. So in today's episode, we'll be rebutting Satan's Guide to the Bible, or to put it more accurately, Satan's Guide to Cherry-Picking Critical Scholars and Ignoring Other Evidence and Views that Support the Bible's Divine Inspiration. In particular, we will cover the documentary's main points on biblical history, morality, authorship, and end times predictions. However, one of the main fallacies the documentary employs in each of these sections is the fallacy of the false dilemma. The main narrator, Satan, makes it seem like you can only choose between a very conservative or even a very fundamentalist answer to a Bible difficulty, or you can choose a very liberal or atheistic answer that the alleged real scholars endorse. But in between these extremes are many faithful, defensible positions about what the Bible teaches. To see this, let's jump into the first section, which claims the Bible can't be inerrant or inspired if it gets history wrong. However, the Second Vatican Council taught that since everything asserted by the inspired authors or sacred writers must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, it follows that the books of Scripture must be acknowledged as teaching solidly, faithfully, and without error that truth which God wanted put into sacred writings for the sake of salvation. Notice the word asserted instead of the word written. Ancient authors use different genres and figures of speech when writing, so that needs to be taken into account when interpreting what is being asserted in the Bible. For example, if I said I have a million things to do today, that's false from a literal perspective, but it's true if you understand that I'm using hyperbole. To give another example, the 19th century poem Paul Revere's Ride is basically accurate about what the Revolutionary War hero did, but it takes poetic license with some of the details. For example, Revere didn't ride alone. He didn't shout the British were coming since the colonists considered themselves to be British, and he wasn't shouting in the night because Revere's Ride was supposed to be a discreet warning about the impending military invasion. That's why the Catechism says of the creation account in Genesis that, quote, the account of the fall in Genesis 3 uses figurative language, but affirms a primeval event, a deed that took place at the beginning of the history of man. While the book of Exodus is not of the same genre as Genesis 1 through 11, Exodus is not a modern historical account either. That means you can interpret Exodus as describing a historical event while taking some poetic license with the details. The documentary argues the Exodus never happened, but it does this through a bait and switch by interviewing scholars who say there's no evidence for a mass Exodus or two million people leaving Egypt. Moses parts the waters and more than two million Israelites escape Egyptian bondage. There is no archaeological evidence that would support an idea of a historical large-scale exodus from Egypt. But many Christian biblical scholars would agree there's no evidence for that large of an exodus. They would say that descriptions of millions of Israelites leaving Egypt are either an exaggeration in the text or hyperbole, a copying error in the numbers involved, or a mistranslation of a term that refers to 600 family groups, not 600,000 men and their accompanying families. However, there is evidence that Semitic peoples lived in Egypt and then migrated to Canaan, where they were later known as Israel. For example, the Egyptian king Kedi Nebkari described in his instructions to Merikari how to deal with Semitic invaders along the Nile Delta who were searching for food during the mid to late second millennium before Christ. That fits well with Genesis' description of Jacob's family traveling to Egypt during that time period in search of food during a widespread famine. And since Israel settled in Goshen on the Nile, the annual flooding would make it very difficult to find archaeological remains from this group, provided you could even distinguish their remains from the remains of other Egyptians. In fact, many of the pharaoh's tombs haven't even been discovered, and neither has the tomb of perhaps its most famous queen, Cleopatra. So it's just because we can't find certain archaeological evidence of Israel and Egypt doesn't mean they weren't there. But James Hoffmeyer, an Egyptologist, provides good evidence of Israel's presence in Egypt in the book he wrote on the subject. And William Dever, who is a well-respected scholar, who himself denies the traditional Exodus accounts, 
also provides evidence of Israel's origin in Egypt, that Israel came to be known to exist in Canaan, but Israel's population also included fugitive slaves from Egypt. He describes this in his book, Who Were the Early Israelites and Where Did They Come From? The documentary also claims there's no evidence of Egyptian influence on Israel. But that's false, given that names like Moses are clearly Egyptian in origin. This can be seen in pharaohs who use the same elements of the name, like Thutmose or Ramses. Or the book of Exodus's use of a transliteration of the Egyptian word for the Nile instead of the regular Hebrew word for river. Instead, there's good evidence that Israel emerged as a unique people group in the late second millennium before Christ. And this is evidenced in the Egyptian Merneptah stele that's been dated from the year 1200 BC, and it attests to Israel's existence. Finally, the documentary says the Israelites were just another group of Canaanites because they worshipped, allegedly, the Canaanite high god El, even saying that the name El is part of the name Israel, or Israel, meaning El will rule. But there's nothing problematic about this aspect of Israel's origin. Israelites who settled in Canaan from Egypt may have simply identified Yahweh and El as just two names referring to the same divine being. According to Old Testament scholar Mark Smith, although the Bible fiercely criticizes other pagan deities like Baal, quote, there are no biblical polemics against El. At an early point, Israelite tradition identified El with Yahweh, or presupposed this equation. This would be similar to how St. Paul affirmed in Acts 17.23 to the Greeks in Athens, I found also an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. And real fast, I want to say that the like and subscribe buttons are not unknown to you. So please hit them and support us at trenhornpodcast.com to help our channel to grow and produce new content. Part two involves objections to the morality taught in the Bible, starting with Psalm 137, which says, O daughter of Babylon, you devastator, happy shall he be who requites you with what you have done to us. Happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. The documentary quotes atheistic Bible scholar Hector Avalos as saying, It's ideas that you should have these babies and strike them up against rocks. To me, it's odious. Extremely unpleasant, repulsive. But here's an important rule to remember when reading the Bible. Just because the Bible records an action, that does not mean the Bible recommends it. In this passage, the psalmist is crying out to God for justice against the Babylonians for sending the Jews into exile. He may have even watched his own family and children be murdered in this way. Since this was before the new covenant in Christ, the best justice he could hope for at that time was eye for an eye, hoping that someone would conquer the Babylonians and execute cruel practices against them for the cruel practices they had executed against the Jews. In fact, the documentary even quotes a Bible scholar who gives the right perspective on the psalm, but the documentary doesn't engage with her perspective. What it would lead to is a deeper empathetic experience. We would understand the anger, we would understand the suffering, we would understand what they thought had been stolen from them in a much deeper way if we were willing to engage the horror that's present there. And so we just tend to repress or ignore those aspects of the Bible, but I think it would be more interesting to engage them. Once again, this doesn't mean God approves of this behavior. God is using the psalmist's honest human emotions to assert the more foundational spiritual truth that God is sovereign over the world and that he is a God of justice. Eventually, God would lead his people to fully understand what that justice should look like. But this was a gradual process, with people often resisting God's plans. Indeed, God progressively led Israel the same way parents progressively teach their children today. Pope Benedict XVI said, Biblical revelation is deeply rooted in history. God's plan is manifested progressively, and it is accomplished slowly, in successive stages and despite human resistance. God chose a people and patiently worked to guide and educate them. So once again, just because the Bible records something, that doesn't mean that God recommends it. Consider the documentary's treatment of Jephthah, a man God chose to lead Israel in the book of Judges to defeat the Ammonites. Jephthah promises that if God gives him victory over the Ammonites, he will offer as a burnt sacrifice whoever greets him when he returns home from victory. And in an ironic twist, his only daughter is the one who greets him, and the Bible says he did with her according to the vow he made. This is part of a section that tries to prove the God of the Bible is okay 
with child sacrifice, and includes scholars saying that this happened in ancient Israel. And yeah, there probably were some ancient Israelites who practiced child sacrifice, because the Bible warns against this practice and demands capital punishment for Israelites who engage in it. But obviously that doesn't mean that God was for it. I mean, he made laws against it. Deuteronomy 12, verses 30-31 through 31 says, Do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods, that I also may do likewise? You shall not do so to the Lord your God. For every abominable thing which the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. But not everyone listens, and one of those people was Jephthah in Judges 11, who promised Yahweh he'd offer a sacrifice of whatever or whoever greeted him when he returned home if God helped him defeat the Ammonites. Now, it's possible he might have been referring to a dog greeting him when he came home, for example, or he could have been thinking of a slave and offering a human sacrifice because Jephthah had some Canaanite origins in his history. Unfortunately, it was his daughter who greeted him. So the Bible says that Jephthah did with her according to his vow. The documentary, though, makes it seem like God supports this because it isn't explicitly condemned in Scripture. But the biblical authors often record awful stories and let the stories themselves be their own condemnation. For example, Judges 19 describes the gang rape and murder of a concubine without the text saying God disapproves of this action. It should simply be obvious God disapproves of what happened to Israel during this point in their history. The point of the book of Judges is that Israel at this time had suffered a grave moral decay, and any decent Israelite hearing the stories would, from this period would know that. The last line of the book even says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. The documentary also points to passages like Exodus 22 as proof God didn't just tolerate child sacrifice among his people, he actively commanded it. First, God didn't tolerate it at all, he opposed it, even though some people broke God's law, but he certainly didn't command it. The verse in Exodus says, You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do likewise with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its dam. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. But back in Exodus 13, the sacred author makes it clear what it means to give sons to God. I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. The Bible talks about how Israel's freedom came because of the death of the firstborn in the final plague in Egypt. So now God requires the firstborn of Israel after that time to be redeemed or bought back through other substitutionary animal sacrifices. Okay, but what about passages where it seems on the face of it, God demands the killing of children? This comes up in the documentary section on the killing of the Canaanites described in passages like Joshua 6 and 1 Samuel 15. How could God order Israel to kill not just adults like the Canaanites who were involved in gravely sinful acts, but innocent children. However, the documentary doesn't seriously consider the idea that God is the author of life, and so God does nothing wrong by ending our lives. If I give you $20 today and $20 tomorrow, and I stop giving you money the next day, I haven't wronged you, because that was a gift you had no right to in the first place. The same is true of God giving us life today, tomorrow, but not the next day. God also has the right to end life as he sees fit, including through violent means if that was necessary to make a public judgment against a gravely sinful people. Indeed, while the documentary says the Bible slanders the Canaanites, it never shows the Bible's depictions of them supporting grave evils was wrong, including evils like incest or child sacrifice. The documentary then takes an interesting twist when it argues that historically the conquest narratives in Joshua never happened. It may seem like good news that God never killed anybody, but the critics say that the mere fact the Bible commands this, even if it wasn't carried out, still shows the Bible is not the Word of God. Well, this paves the way for us to talk about another way of understanding these conquest texts beyond a directly literal reading. We can understand it this way, that they're non-literal. Phrases like, all were struck down with the edge of the sword, all were destroyed, that are repeated over and over again in these passages, are typical of hyperbole used in ancient battle accounts. For example, the Egyptian Merneptah stele I mentioned earlier, that is the first reference we have to Israel, says Israel was laid waste and his seed is not. 
even though the nation of Israel continued to exist for centuries after the stele was erected. Other ancient Syrian and Egyptian texts talk about how opposing armies were completely destroyed, even instantaneously. But those same texts also refer to the continued existence of the supposedly destroyed forces. The purpose of Joshua and Samuel's bombastic rhetoric may not have been to provide a strictly literal recounting of Israel's confrontations with the Canaanites. Indeed, Joshua seems to contradict Judges. Judges describes the Canaanites being a continual presence and threat to Israel. It may instead have been used to describe in grandiose language the battles that Israel faced, without denying the threat that these groups posed even after the military engagements were over. A later chronicler in Israel's history may have used this hyperbolic language to underscore to his audience the importance of making a complete break with the neighboring pagan religions. Remember also that God allowed the ancient authors of Scripture to retain their own worldviews, which were theologically and morally undeveloped. For example, the early parts of the Old Testament do not explicitly teach other gods are false gods who don't exist. The early Israelites thought they existed. It's why they were tempted to worship them. Even Jesus said the Old Testament allowed divorce because of the people's hardness of heart, even though that was never God's plan for marriage. As Pope Benedict XVI said, God was progressively leading people who were steeped in a culture very different from our own, where war was extremely brutal. He also allowed them to retain other false beliefs about the world that impacted how they understood God. According to the Catholic biblical scholar Matthew Ramage, in his book, Dark Passages of the Bible, if it seemed clear to the ancient writer that God wanted a certain battle won, and the tactics employed therein were successful, then God must have sanctioned or even directly willed these tactics, end quote. Just remember that if these texts bother you, know that the church doesn't have a settled teaching on how they should be interpreted. It's possible that their non-literal descriptions meant to emphasize Israel's need to maintain its unique holy cultural standards, and that they're not literal descriptions of historical events. Moreover, the fact that they use evil acts of warfare as these symbols could reflect on how God came down to the level of understanding of these ancient people with language and other examples that they understood, rather than directly affirming this kind of behavior. However, you might say that questioning the literal nature of these stories reflects a view of Scripture that denies its divine inspiration. But that's not the case. In a conversation with journalist Peter Sewald, Pope Benedict XVI was asked about the supposed contradiction between God issuing the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill, in Exodus 2013, and then just a few chapters later, ordering the Israelites to kill 3,000 of their brethren as punishment for idolatry. Here is part of Benedict's reply. The story that follows does sound terribly bloodthirsty, and for us it is scarcely comprehensible. There, too, we have to look forward toward Christ. He does the opposite. He takes death upon himself and does not kill others. But in this moment of the Sinai story, Moses, as it were, puts into effect what is already present. The other people have perverted their own lives. How far we should take this story literally is another question. The people of Israel stay in existence. What happens expresses the truth that anyone who turns from God not only departs from the covenant, but from the sphere of life. They ruin their own life, and in doing so, enter into the realm of death, end quote. Next, we have claims of dubious authorship, where Satan shocks his students by saying that the prophet Daniel didn't actually write the biblical book of Daniel, and St. Paul did not write many of the letters in the New Testament that are attributed to him. But I know many Christians, Protestant and Catholic, who are aware of these authorship issues and see nothing incompatible with their faith. Concerning Paul's letters, Paul used secretaries when he wrote and lists co-authors like Timothy and Sylvanus. And that may explain why some of Paul's letters sound different enough because they came from a different co-author. The Holy Spirit may also have inspired writers who were Paul's disciples to write works out of tribute to him under his name. In the third century, Tertullian describes someone who did this as doing it out of love for Paul, and not out of any desire to be some kind of wicked forger. The Church infallibly teaches that these books are Scripture, but it does not infallibly teach which human beings wrote them. Since God is all-powerful, he can work through any human author to communicate his divine revelation. So discovering this fact later through biblical scholarship does not contradict the Christian faith. The documentary also focuses on the Gospels and casts doubt on supposedly illiterate fishermen writing the Gospels or other letters in the New Testament, like First and Second Peter. 
But Luke was probably a physician, and Mark could have been a literate member of society. And of course, Matthew was a tax collector, so he was no doubt literate. We also don't know if the apostles were truly illiterate, since the only reference to that is Acts 4.13, where the Sanhedrin says they were unlettered, ordinary men. This could mean that they simply hadn't received rabbinical training, not not that they couldn't read or write. Finally, as I noted with Paul, they could have used secretaries, co-authors, or entrusted their testimony to a disciple to write it down for them. And just to be clear, none of this shows the Bible is uninspired, because, as I said, God is free to use any kind of human author he wants to write scripture, even ones using a literary genre we don't often see today that involves attributing your work to another author. Finally, the documentary cast doubt on Jesus and the resurrection by saying that St. Paul, the earliest witness to Jesus' resurrection, never mentions an empty tomb. But so what? As I note in my book, Counterfeit Christ, Paul said that Jesus was raised from the dead and appeared to his disciples, including groups of disciples. Moreover, as a Pharisee, Paul believed in a bodily resurrection. So the emptiness of the site where Jesus was buried would be implied in Paul's message about the resurrection. It doesn't have to be explicitly stated. Also, the documentary claims that early Christians were end times weirdos who incorrectly thought the world was about to end because Jesus allegedly incorrectly taught the world was going to end in passages like Mark 9.1 and Mark 13.30. But remember, there is a difference between what the sacred author says and what the Holy Spirit asserted through his writings. Paul may have hoped he would be alive when Christ returned and maybe even expected it to happen but he did not teach this would happen in his letters. It was just part of his background knowledge, something that also changed by the end of his life when he realized in 2 Timothy that he would die before Christ would return. Jesus made it clear that no one would know the hour of his return, but that it would be unexpected. So it's not surprising the first Christians were on alert that this unexpected time could very well be within their own lifetimes. But could they have gotten the wrong idea from Jesus' own teachings? The documentary says Jesus was simply wrong when he said, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God coming with power, Mark 9.1. Or you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes, Matthew 10.23. As well as descriptions of the stars falling from heaven and saying, This generation will not pass away before all these things take place, Mark 13.30. Some of Jesus' prophecies refer to his second coming, but not all of them. Immediately after Mark 9-1, Jesus is seen in power and glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Also, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, and more importantly, the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70, was considered the end of a world for the Jewish people. The temple was the center place of Jewish life. It was God's dwelling place. It really was the universe of the Jewish people. The temple even had a large menorah within it that symbolized the stars and other celestial objects. This is described by ancient Jewish writers like Philo and Josephus. So when the temple was destroyed, these elements that symbolized the stars fell with it. Finally, I want to note that this skeptical approach to the Bible reminds me of a shift that has happened in the last 40 years on people's views of the Bible. During this time, Gallup polling agency released a poll that asked people what they think of the Bible, and they let people choose three answers. The Bible is the actual word of God and should be taken literally word for word. The Bible is the inspired word of God, but not everything should be taken literally word for word. Or the Bible is an ancient book of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. Now, none of these is perfect, but if I had to pick one, I'd pick the middle one. Saying the Bible is the literal, actual word of God and everything is literal word for word seems to deny the human elements of Scripture and how God allowed the human authors to be true authors. God did not just dictate to them what he wanted written down. And of course, the last option denies the divine elements of Scripture. The first and last choices, then, are a kind of fundamentalist or -or all-or-nothing approach to the Bible. Now, here's where it gets interesting. From 1984 to 2014, the number of people who say the Bible is the actual Word of God dropped by nine points, while the number who said it's a book of fables increased by nine points. The middle option gained a point. Fast forward to 2022, and the change in our culture is striking. In 1984, 37% of people said the Bible is the actual Word of God. 
46% say the, it's the inspired word of God, and only 12% said it's a book of fables. But in 2022, nearly 40 years later, only 20% said it's the actual word of God. 49% said it's inspired, so it gained by a few points. And 29%, more than option one, said it's a book of fables. So what seems to be happening is that Christians who had a very rigid, fundamentalist view of Scripture that couldn't withstand the facts of biblical scholarship ended up just abandoning the faith altogether. They took an all-or-nothing approach. It's not that Christians are becoming atheists per se. It's just that the fundamentalists were switching sides. So maybe it's this overly rigid approach to Scripture that is the problem, and a more nuanced approach is necessary. And if you like such an approach, then definitely check out my book, Hard Sayings, A Catholic Approach to Answering Bible Difficulties. Thank you guys so much, and I hope you have a very blessed day.